Are you starting? Yeah, yeah. Okay. Starts, yeah. Okay. okay. Let's try and do Facebook at the same time. Okay. Well, hello, everybody. Welcome as you're joining SPNI's ongoing webinar series. I'm Jay Shofit, coming to you from my car. I'm actually in Ranana, so hopefully if there's any sirens in Tel Aviv, I'll be okay. Lawrence and Modine, where there are very few sirens. Lawrence Kasner with us tonight. Welcome everybody. Wow, everybody's joining. Thanks so much. Let us know uh, that you're here, where you're from. Happy to uh, happy to engage anytime. During this webinar, afterwards, we're uh, looking forward to hearing from you. Got a very interesting webinar tonight on the impacts of the war and a little bit of looking towards um, the impacts of the war, of course, on the environment and on wildlife. Looking forward towards how we're going to be rehabilitating the uh, what we call OTEF Aza. Technically, that's the envelope around Gaza. We call it, I guess, in English, the Gaza border area, the environs. I'm going to call it a lot of things tonight, Jay. Don't worry. Okay, a lot of things. Lawrence has a lot of, hopefully, uh, we'll be bouncing back and forth. Synonyms, in English, Hebrew, everything. So. I just want to teach everybody Otef Aza. It's, yeah, there'll be, there'll although be it's, it's, as well. Yeah. But uh, anyway, I want to thank everybody who's here. Uh, thank everybody who supports us during this emergency campaign period. Uh, and and uh, always on our ongoing nature preservation projects. Especially want to thank our dedicated lay leaders, our board members of uh, Nature Israel and the United States and Canada in the UK, uh, and supporters around the world. Um, I'm on my phone. It's harder for me to see the chats and Q and A. Write your questions. Apparently, in the isn't, apparently the chat isn't. Apparently, the chat isn't on. But I'm gonna. I'm just turning it on now. Oh, okay. So you can do that. Why. That's good. I, I, yeah, it's a good start for the chat. Thank you, Hadassah, for letting us know. Not to remember all the settings. Um, I hope you can do that. I think once we tried it, we didn't do it beforehand, and it wasn't. Like available no oh, that would be a shame well, if not we'll have to go, if not we'll have you'll just have to write everything in q a and i'll take everything every comment as a question <laughs> oh fine. sorry about that are you sure we can't do that i'm having just a quick look now to just check all the um all the settings and then if not then i think everything is going to be a question unfortunately unfortunately um, I'm oh. just seeing. Random thing, pause, quiz, survey. No, I, I think we're going to just be uh, writing. Um, sorry, I think. Well, it, thank I, you, everybody. Uh, sorry, Martin, uh, Judith in London, and Anonymous from London, and Dasa from New York. Thank you. Yeah, let us know where you are in the um, in the questions, and we'll be able to separate the questions. Mm -hmm. At Thank the you. end of the webinar. Hi, Martin. Sorry about that. Um, try one more time. One more thing. We're um, only a couple minutes after the hour. People still joining. Also live on Facebook. Yes. yes. Society for the Protection of Nature on Facebook. Uh, let your friends know. Please forward uh, these uh, emails to anybody or let us know if you anybody want to put anybody on our mailing list to get these webinar announcements and the occasional other mail from us. Hope everybody had a happy Thanksgiving in North America. Oh, the chat's on now. Looks like it. Or well, at least I, you wrote something. I, I, my chat is working, so it's going to be a, it's going to be a monologue in more ways than one. I think we can say it's a monologue, it's a lecture, it's a presentation. Ah, here we go. Here we go. I got the chat working. Oh, well, thank everybody. Well That's done, great. Lawrence. Good job, Lawrence. Yes, Lawrence. Good. Uh, there's a position open for you in the IT department, no doubt. <laughs> of Zoom, please, God. Wow, well, everybody. Time. Thanks so much. Uh, Philadelphia and um, Maine, my favorite parts of the country. Um. Well, we'll let everybody say hello, 
give it another minute or two and uh, get underway here for what will be a very interesting webinar. I've been privy to some of it, but I think some of it will be new to me. Uh, looking forward to uh, to hearing about the topic and, and especially as we go into, uh, well, I mean, there's no end in sight for the war, or the hostages here on day 50 something, 57, 58. Um, but we are beginning, everybody's beginning. There has been established in Israel and a rehabilitation authority, Minhelata Tkuma in Hebrew. Um, uh, and we are not officially part of it. It's a government, uh, it's a branch of the government, but working through the various ministries, we have a lot to say about how, how we hope uh, to rebuild the Gaza environs. I think Lawrence will touch on that at the end, and we'll be talking much more about that in the future. Um, really, hello, everybody from Farmington Hills, Michigan, Beersheba, Santa Fe. Hello, Dan, one of our board members, Dan Pava, and uh, Malaya Dumim, and Boynton Beach, Modi'in, and uh, you got a neighbor there, Lawrence, Joburg. No, and Long Beach. She, could, she could come for like a live session, like uh, have a San live Francisco, audience. Doug in Seattle, Saginaw. Toronto, of course, Pittsfield, Mass, my neck of the woods, grew up across the line in New York State. Uh, L.A., Northwest Indiana, that's a, kind of a new one to us. Uh, maybe I haven't seen it recently. Bobby and Skokie, hello, hello. So good to see you, Bobby. It was great seeing you in person uh, last oh, month. Andy, uh, Andy and Laurie are here. Oh, my gosh. They're, my, they're, they're one, of my favorite, my, one of my favorite people. I had a whole lot interview with them. They're so helpful to me. So, hello. So excited they're here. We um, who are you talking about, uh, Lawrence? Um, Andy and Laurie's Danzig, who are here in Canada. Oh, very nice. Yes, oh, yeah, of course. Yeah. Hello, That's Andy so and Laurie. Yes, I'm back. And Judith right. and everybody. So I think, Lawrence, should we yeah, get underway get here on the road. after the hour? Let's, let's do this. The impact of the uh, current war on uh, on nature and wildlife. And uh, take it away, Mr. Lawrence Casimir, our uh, special projects coordinator in the Development Department at uh, SBNI, back with us for his third stint in SBNI. Uh, uh, hello, Maggie and Leon. Always great to see you. Longtime former board chair, Leon Sokol. And uh, thanks a lot, Lawrence. I'll be quiet right. unless there's anything uh, urgent, and we'll pick it up at about, uh, you know, 15 minutes before the hour. All right. Okay. Well, hopefully this time I won't meet you. So that will be uh, better I than mean, last time. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. Um, it's really uh, good to be here. And it's, it's good to be back, as Jay said, after after two years. This is this is time number three for me, um, which is uh, very, very weird. Um, but I, I'm really privileged to be able to sort of, uh, to come back again that Jay uh, decided to, to rehire me. Um, and uh, Dan as well to, to make to make that happen. It wasn't so easy. Um, and I'm really happy to be here with you. Um, so when in preparing this webinar, it was like to be honest it, it was it was difficult not necessarily the material but just writing um, about the impact of, of the war on nature um while the fighting was going on especially over, over the last week um when uh, we had the the nightly anxiety of whether the hostages would be released which hostages were they okay what condition what condition were they in how's the recovery going um and, and that and, and that made it, it, it very very diff difficult on, on that level but but on another level i i personally was was very very curious about what um about how the war has impacted um, nature and the environment it's something that i care about obviously because i i keep coming back um to work for for SBNI, which whose mission is to, to protect israel's environment and um and I, I really haven't seen that much about it, like haven't seen that much about it. So, um, so I, I volunteered a couple of weeks ago to to put this together for everyone because I, I think because these are questions that we have received and um, no, we don't really have a, a a clear answer. We haven't had a clear answer until now. Lots of people knew lots of different things. Um, so I put it together. So um, just before we start, I just want to thank all the people. I assume everyone can see my screen. Um, they're probably going to tell me no. Can everyone see my screen? I'm just looking at the chat to say. Um, yes, do, yes, yes, yes. Yeah, everyone can see my screen. Great. Yep. Okay, yep. brilliant. And, so just and, before a we on, to or, and a quick shout out to Aura Bijou. Hi, Aura. <laughs> um, so I just want to thank everyone uh, in SB9. There's a, and there's someone outside of SB9 uh, who helped me um, with this presentation. So Adit, Alain, 
Amir, Draw, uh, Guy, uh, Yoav, and, and Yashai Kushner, who's, who's a vet, um, who uh, helped me um, with some of the stuff at the beginning. So, oops, let's go on. No, wrong way. Okay, so we'll start. Um, so this uh, webinar is in four sections. Um, so section one is about the wolf's impact on animals. Um, so unsurprisingly, um, and I'm sure this is probably the question that most people like, say, has the wolf hurt animals? The answer is yes. Um, some animals uh, have been hurt. For example, this uh, long-eared owl, uh, who's, as you can see in this picture, um, his wing uh, is damaged. I'm going to say his, it could be a her, I don't know. Um, their wing is damaged. Um, and a soldier found them and they were taken to, um, oh, by the way, don't, don't raise your hands. Just write your question in, in the Q and A and I'll, I'll, I'll try and I'll see what everyone's written and I'll respond after each section of the webinar. Um, so I just, uh, warn you now. Um, so, um, so this owl, uh, was injured and the soldier found him and, uh, in situations like this, um, what, what the soldiers do is they call, um, what's called the hibernance, which is, uh, 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 animal ambulance run by uh, the Israeli Park and Nature Authority, which is part of the government, and they take them to the animal hospital in uh, in the uh, Ramagan Safari, which is uh, in Tel Aviv. For, for those of you who notice, which is a really excellent safari, which is the the um, and you see here this uh, porcupine. Uh, this porcupine was was injured um, from a from shrapnel falling from a rocket interception. In Rishon Letzion, uh, which is uh, just uh, south of uh, Tel Aviv, as uh, a uh, part of uh, like central Israel, uh, and you can see here um, on the back, it, his, um, he, he, you can see a, a bit of um, a bit of damage to his to his, to his backside, and here is uh, an anesthetic, an anesthetic, and he's being checked out, um, and this is what the parks. This is uh, one of the the roles of the Parks and Nature Authority, and they have this uh, great animal hospital uh, to look after. Um, animals like the owl, and there's a falcon which got injured. Um, this porcupine got injured uh, through the war, and also this hyena. So um, this is a striped hyena, not the spotted hyenas like we have in the Lion King, uh, very famous, more famously. Um, this is the striped hyena, like Ruti the hyena from Modi'in, um, uh, um, and she. Uh, this this hyena this is a hyena pup. This is about uh, he's about four months old. And he was found injured in the West Bank, in fact. Um, and this and the soldier picked him up, and he's being carried uh, in his ceramic um, plate. Uh, he, he this this hind has uh, broken his, one of his his legs, and uh, he was taken to the animal hospital where they did uh, operation on him, put a pin in his uh, in his in his uh, in his legs, uh, put a, a very very tough plaster cast on it so he couldn't um, chew through it. And now he's uh, in rehab. And um, hopefully he'll be released into the wild. But I, I think between you and me, I, I don't see it happening. Uh, he's very, very young and probably won't learn uh, uh, adult behaviours, how to how to survive in the wild. So most likely he'll end up living um, living permanently at either, either the safari um, or one of the Park and Nature Authorities uh, res um, uh, reserves, either in the Carmel or by Elat. Um, so here we have a, a great picture, one of my favourite of, of the webinar, of, of uh, Kaz. So the uh, the border, the Gaza envelope communities, um, as Jay said, Otef Gaza. Um, as I may go in and out of, um, we'll, we'll see how I, see whether I can restrain myself as we uh, go on. Um, so so the so the the community. The Otef, uh, the the Gazan envelope communities are kibbutzim and very agricultural areas, and these cows um, and they obviously milk cows. And after and on October the seventh, there wasn't a chance to evacuate the cows because everyone was uh, fleeing for their lives or under attack, and that's a problem for for the cows because uh, these are milking cows and cow the milking cows have to be milked every uh, few days. Uh, sorry, every one or two days even, uh, otherwise their milk, dry, it's very painful for them and their milk dries up. Um, so once the area was secure, um, volunteers came um, to uh, to help look after all these cows, uh, to feed them, to milk them, uh, to evacuate them where there was the potential to do that. Uh, sorry, excuse me. Um, and uh, and like some cows were were, were killed in the attack. Um, there were some reports of cows trying to escape the enclosure because they weren't fed and were trying to to to, to escape and, and find food, and they ended up trapped. 
uh, but but the, you know the farm animals were also impacted by by the war, and I just wanted to touch on that. So the other, I guess, domestic animals impacted by the war were pets. And uh, as I'm sure many of you know, uh, Israeli civil society has really stepped up, um, not just SBNI, but but civil society, uh, but the civil society as a whole, and the uh, brothers and sisters in arms uh, organization, which. Uh, which were leading the process movement, uh, one of the the main organizers and main logistic forces, as we uh, as as we've gone on, and uh, they set up a uh, a room. Uh, they set up uh, within within their organi their organization, um, a, uh, I guess a unit. You could say a unit, I guess, but like a little department of people whose jobs it was was to take care of the of the pets of all the soldiers who had just been called up. Um, obviously, if the soldiers are called up, they have to they have to go to where they've been told to, and don't necessarily have time. To uh to give their pets to someone else, um so so the uh, so brothers and sisters in arms and they they called that this little unit the National War Room the Dogs of War, um when well, Hebrew that's uh, Kelev Pargum, and uh, and they they made sure that that all pets um you know dogs cats birds hamsters uh, fish um had someone to look after them uh, during the war, uh while the soldiers were were called up and continue to be called up. And uh, and also the pets from from uh, from people in the community from from the Gaza border community who were fleeing for their lives with with pretty much just the the clothes on their back and who didn't have a chance an opportunity to take uh, their pets with them um, over the, the the days when the soldiers had moved in to secure the area the um, the, the the soldiers were passing the pets um, out of the out of the war zone. Um, to um, to uh, to the national uh, war, the national war room for, for the dogs of the dogs of war and making sure that they were also either reunited with their owners with possible where possible which was unfortunately not so often uh, uh, not always possible um, as we'll go on for in in a second um, or to or just to, or to find a foster home for them uh, for the for the time being um, so as I just said uh, not all animals can be uh, reunited with their owners at this time so this is uh, Dr. Yoav Perlman who uh, works for SPNI and um, as our head of birding I'm, I'm sure some of you have, have seen him before on our webinars and this is uh, his new dog Lo his new dog Lola um, uh, Lola was uh, was living in one of the uh, the, the smaller kibbutzim uh, in the Gaza envelope on October 7th with with uh, his with her family and and the, the family fled and are now living in in a lat. Um, so uh, some SBNI staff um, have were, were been called out to the war, and they knew that, uh, and, and they knew that Yoav was looking for a dog, and they, they they found this dog. And you know, I think other soldiers pass on to to the SBNI guys because they know that SBNI guys are nature people. And uh, and Yoav and the, and the dog and, the, and Lola uh, got to Yoav. Um, so. That, that that worked out quite nicely, and and Yav uh, took Lola to the vet to make sure that she wasn't injured, it wasn't wasn't having any ill effects from from her from her uh, traumatic experience, um, and uh, she had a chip, and uh, the chip had the, the owner's number, and Yav called the owner, and um, the owner's living currently in a hotel in Alat, and they can't take the dog, so so for now uh, it looks like uh, Lola's going to be living with Yav, and and unfortunately like many families um you know we have tens of thousands probably up to 200,000 families currently in Israel sorry people in Israel not families but people in Israel are currently uh, internally displaced they they're not living in their homes because of the security situation and they they're living in the hotels and and um you know they it's, it gives them peace of mind to know that other people are looking at their you know their pets which are members of their family like I'm sure and many of us have uh, pets and who are members of our family too um, you know, it gives them peace of mind to know that someone uh, is looking after them. Um, so, if, if you if if you leave now, um, I, I will tell you that probably the main environmental impact on of, of the war on on nature is this issue. So, I'm going to play this uh, video very very quickly. It has uh, sound, it has uh, someone talking in Hebrew, uh, which I'll talk a little. I'll, I'll sort of just talk over her because it's not that relevant. Um, but this I got uh, from Yeshai the vet. Um, and these, these, this is a pack of uh, dogs, of feral wild dogs, which have come over from Gaza. So, so you can just, okay, I'm just going to pause it there because it's distracting me from talking over her. Um, when I practiced, I didn't have her sound, so I should have used this computer. Um, so, so these are wild dogs. Um, they uh, just not, they, they have come over the, the border from, from Gaza. Uh, through holes in the fence, uh, they normally subsist on landfill in Gaza and garbage, 
uh, and, and now they're, they're here, they're, they're feral, they're wild, that they're not vaccinated. And they're, they're, you know, they're, they're wild dogs. I remember once going to the Gazelle Valley, um, before it was the Gazelle Valley, uh, the official Gazelle Valley, and, and with the donor, uh, when there were just two gazelles left. And it was all very, very exciting because there was a wild dog in, in the park and it was literally just this lab wild Labrador, which they were very, which uh, the, the, the rangers were very, very worried about. And we had to get the, the vet in to, to shoot, uh, not to shoot, to tranquilize the dog and remove it from the park to keep the gazelle safe. And and this is what's happening here. We have, um, it, it should be no surprise that the, the greatest threat to, uh, to, to to the ecosystem is introduction of uh, of predators. Uh, to the ecosystem these these dogs have been hunting already um reports of there have been reports of them hunting uh, other small dogs cats uh even gazelles um birds uh you know they're hungry and they 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 need to eat uh, like anything else and and they're doing it as a pack which which is a uh, highly problematic for uh uh for for for, for all the other animals and, and the nature in in the in the gaza border communities um, at the moment, uh, the population is stable, but once we get to the spring and uh, and, and breeding season, they are going to there's there's going to be puppies, and I'm sure they're going to breed uh, with with the pets um, of, of like uh, of stray pets which have not been uh, successfully collected up yet. And uh, this is going to be uh, something that that's going to need to be taken care of quite urgently because uh, these dogs are not especially afraid of humans, uh, which is uh, which which is definitely a risk, uh, which can be dangerous. Uh, there's a potential for them to carry diseases like rabies. Um, they could have uh, fleas and worms and other stuff that we don't that ne don't necessarily want to uh, have mixing with with uh, domestic pets. Um, and uh, it will probably be up to the Park and Nature Authority, the Army Vets, uh, and the Ministry, uh, the municipalities, and the Ministry of uh, Environmental Protection to take care of this. Uh, SBI does not do everything, and this is uh, not something that we'll be uh, directly involved in. But uh, needs to. But this is something that. Everyone I spoke with talked about this. Like it came up time and time again, and this is this is probably the major issue. Um, so I'm sure it wouldn't surprise me if, if some people are wondering what's the uh, wolf's impact on, on bird life. Um, just as a summary for for, un, for not regular um, viewers, um, Israel is a bottleneck on the migration. You can see where Elat is uh, on the map and all the red lines converging. Um, so at this time of year, uh, birds are flying south for the, for the winter. Uh, to have a, a nice uh, a nice winter in warm Africa. Uh, the October 7th um, attacks, I would say, um, uh, uh, coincided with, 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 I guess, the, the end of the peak of the migration. Um, but for those of, uh, those of you wondering, uh, worried about the, uh, about the, the impact on, on the migration as a whole, um, the, yeah, I asked Yav and he said, so far there's been no signs of it. Um, if any, uh, if, if there's been any impact to the war, it's been on, on local species. Uh, so these are three local species which winter in uh, in the western uh, Negev, which is sort of the region which is uh, where where the Gaza communities are uh, are located. Um, so at the top here we have uh, an, an, an imperial eagle. Um, bottom left is a pallid harrier, and bottom right is a sociable lapwing. And these are all local spe these are all species which winter in the area. Um, yes, some, not all birds um, fly uh, migrate through Israel. Some actually stop here to spend the winter, and it's it's great for for bird watchers. Um, and um, and ultimately, the, the main impact of the war is if 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 they don't like it, these are birds. They just fly off to somewhere else where it's uh, quieter, or there's less explosions, or or whatever. There's so far, there's been there's there been no impact. It's it's not breeding season yet, so it's not nesting season uh, for for the animals. So 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 far, that's not uh, impacted. But obviously, as we get closer to the spring, um, this will be um, this will be something of uh, of more concern to us. Um, so this is the Kula Valley. Um, the war is being fought uh, very much on two fronts. So there's a there's there's a, uh, a front with Hezbollah. Uh, and in the north, which is uh, obviously Hezbollah is a, is a Lebanese uh, terror organization, which is firing rockets at us. And these are cranes in, in the Khula Valley. And um, yeah, they're, they're also really not that bothered by by the war, by what's, go by, by what's going on. Um, the, Yav was telling me that there was a, uh, a live stream. Unfortunately, I don't have that video with us of, uh, of flamingos uh, in the Khula Lake um, feeding uh, happily. And um, there was a large explosion, I guess, uh, very, very near them, very, very noticeable. And, um, you know, they 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 really weren't bothered. 
um they just they just kept uh, feeding so really um yeah the war hasn't affected the birds so much um so uh, one thing which came to my attention um very very early on in the war actually in the first uh, week or so of the war was was a was a facebook post uh, from i believe uh the kkl uh, jnf i'm looking for volunteer bird watchers to go and look um for for large flocks of birds uh to uh help um to, to help them map the sky so that planes would not uh, collide with them so fighter jets would not collide with them and uh, there haven't been any reports of fighter jets colliding with with, with the cranes and i asked uh, i asked about this as well and um yeah they said that they do this every year so it's just the, the main issue this year was that a lot of the, the skilled bird watchers were, were out uh were, had been called up to uh, the reserves and they needed extra manpower and uh and obviously SBNI uh, helps with this in a slightly more uh, technical uh ways uh, for example, the, the radar station at, at La Trun, um, rather than, um, you know, and, and that's how we contribute to this effort. And we, we're still doing this and uh, it's, it's a major part. Um, this is a pretty uh, gruesome story. And I and uh, it, it, I suggest muting yourself for four minutes because this is pretty uh, morbid and coming back in, in a second. Um, so um, these are black kites, uh, which are also a bird of prey. Um, and we have uh, tens of thousands of them uh, wintering here in Israel. They're a very, very common bird. And um, whenever I go bird watching, if I see a raptor in the sky, it's normally a black kite. Um, and so these, these black kites um, spend uh, the winter uh, where the pin is, which is uh, just northwest of Beersheba, which is um, a Dudaim landfill site. So they just scavenge from the landfill site. Um, and every day they basically... Um, uh, not migrate, what's the word, commute. They commute to Gaza, where the landfill sites in Gaza, uh, where where they, where they you know, uh, scavenge for food and they come back. So so lots and lots of bird of prey are scavengers. And and after and after October 7th, there were many, many missing people and the security forces and the, the IDF and, and the police and uh, and all the authorities were, were looking at in, for innovative ways to try and find um, uh, the bodies uh, to find any bodies and to try and identify them, and so one, uh, so someone I, I don't know who uh, suggested uh, using um, the, the uh, ra uh, tracking data of of the birds. Uh, we have a project, a joint project for many many years with the Israel Electric Company, uh, the Park and Nature Authority, and us. To, uh, to they, we put um, trackers, uh, satellite trackers, on the birds. And uh, it helps us um, sort of map uh, the fly the the airways and to try and uh, remove uh, obstacles, uh, mainly uh, overhead power lines uh, from places which can be really uh, damaging uh, to birds, where, where birds uh, get hurt a lot. Um, and in fact, the, the picture uh, at the beginning of this section about the bird life um, was from a golden eagle, which was uh, injured uh, in a power line over since the beginning of the war. Like, so just had an injury, nothing to do with the war. Um, and so, and so, this tracking data helps to see where the birds are going, uh, are, or whether the birds are on the ground or in the air. And um, people, and 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 basically, the people were looking at at, at the at, at the data and looking to see where the birds were landing and where they landing in, in 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 unexpected places. And it turns out they were, and that's because um, unfortunately they 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 have found some of the bodies. Um, and um, yeah, I, I like I. I you know, this is, you know, it's horrible. Um, I, I'm only talking about, like, there was a debate uh, uh, whether to share this or not, and we're only I'm only showing this because the Park and Nature Authority had uh, had already publicised this story uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, maybe at the beginning of last week. Um, so we felt comfortable to share share this with you because it is obviously uh, morbid and gruesome. Um, but I'm sure, um, you know, this brought peace to the, you know, the news brought peace to the families. And uh, I guess this is um, the nature's um, greatest contribution um, to to the war. Um, I'm just going to have a quick pause to see if there's any questions about anything I've said so far. Um, um, so Gavria, okay, I'll come back to volunteering. Uh, Martin said about the hyena. Uh, hyenas are not more prevalent now. They're just no, no, they're, no. It's, it's just a good spot to see a hyena um, in Mevaseret. Uh, Susan, um, yeah, so the feral dogs being given um, rabies uh, rabies and uh, vaccines and how they're being controlled. Yeah, they, they, all these things are, are possible. It's just the authorities have to have to budget it and actually do it. 
um, and, and they're going to need to because otherwise this is going to be um, a main uh, real issue. Just going to check that's the Q and A all answered. Just going to check the chat. Okay, excellent. Yeah, Lawrence, um, I'll just I'll just answer about the hyenas. Just just fill in that for a second. Just, they're very common in the center of the country. You can hear them and see them all over the the Jerusalem hills and north of that, and in the center of the country. Even Modine, of course, had the famous Ruthi that Lawrence mentioned, uh, who was a kind of a local celebrity before she was unfortunately um, hit by a car. But um, but yeah, they're 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 common all over, as are jackals, and uh, we haven't heard of any sorts of migrations or any animals being forced out of the Gaza area and populating other areas. The one war the thing we're most worried about, as Lawrence intimated, is the feral dog population. Yeah, I, I wouldn't say uh, hyenas hyenas are, are common, but they're they're not like a super rare species. There's quite there's quite a nice population of them in Israel. Um, right, anyway. not common, but but seen everywhere. Yeah, we 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 have them. Um, okay, so we'll move on to the IDS impact uh, on nature, because uh, there is one. Um, so, whoop, hopefully we're going to go forward. Come on, where's my slideshow? Hold on, my computer is crashing. That's not good. Okay, um, okay. so just as, as a way of introduction to this section, um, SBNI has been working with the, with the Army uh, through a very imaginatively named project called the Army for the Protection of Nature. Um, we've been doing this for 10 years now. Um, uh, it started as a project which uh, to provide funding um, for commanders to uh, to conserve and preserve nature and habitats on their bases. A very effective project because a lot of uh, rare ecosystems in Israel are actually found within uh, army bases, which are closed security zones, uh, which makes them very very effective to, uh, uh, nature reserves, unofficial nature reserves. And um, so this here is a uh, is a bird called a hubara bustard, which is a very very famous. Uh, for its um, mating dance in the spring. And this lives at an Air Force base, excuse me, in the south of uh, Israel. Um, so I just wanted to say that. And um, and the project in the last like four or five years has has evolved um, to SBNI um, being a, uh, uh, to SBNI working with the engineering and logistics uh, departments and planning departments to uh, to help um, develop plans to mitigate um, and adapt uh, army bases and army operations for climate change. So uh, we've been helping the army develop protocols uh, for all these things, and uh, and uh, and that's uh, had an impact now. So it probably doesn't uh, take uh, uh, an expert to realize that that the army is going to have a big impact uh, on the on the environment on the ground because of these heavy vehicles and the caterpillar tracks. Um, yes, they they turn up the ground. Um, in the south, it's much much less of an issue because we're dealing with the grasslands and the sandy soil, as we'll talk about in a minute. But in the north of Israel, it's more it's much more of a problem. The soil is uh, much more like traditionally, as we think of soil as soily, uh, clay. Uh, we have uh, forest uh, it's, it's forest land, um, rivers. Um, it, it is much more of an issue. Um, and uh, in particular, one of the like, the issues is is actually to do with how the the trucks uh, churn up the land, and um, and the issue of runoff is uh, rain runoff. Um, so we have um, so we've worked with uh, the engineering corps to uh, make some uh, suggestions uh, to promote nature based solutions. Um, so what we want to do, so what, so we want uh, ideally um, when they're making drainage channels, and um, and dealing with uh, how the water flows around the bases to try and encourage the water to uh, to stay in one place so it can go into the soil um, as opposed to just uh, running in uh, in rivers and, and creating floods uh, further downstream or downhill, which is not good, especially if you're sleeping there. Um, where possible, we want to divert the runoff uh, to create natural ecosystems, uh, whether that's um, pools or rivers or, or whatever, just to try and uh, try and integrate um, the flow of water into in, into nature because nature is obviously much much better at managing uh, water and uh, runoff than, than we uh, humans are, and um, and again uh, and, and and finally uh, where there's lots of uh, water runoff after the rains um, is to uh, is to try and restore restore the channels and connect them to uh, I don't think it should be natural training basins but probably drainage basins uh, someone. Who who is maybe present maybe someone can't type very well, which would be me. So sorry about that. Um, I'll correct that later. Um, yeah. So so drainage is, is an issue, especially as we get into into the rainy season. Um, it's going to be pretty miserable for the soldiers if if their camps are flooding and obviously it damages equipment. Um, it gu it it gums up uh, wheels, 
if things are getting too muddy because because the water isn't flowing properly. So this is one way we're we're helping the army. And um, another way is uh, we're help we're we're, we're helping um, infantry uh, combat soldiers. And we're train. Um, we're, we're we've been doing training. We've been providing training courses. Uh, that we've trained about two thousand uh, soldiers so far to help them um, reengage with 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 uh, with our innate with humans' innate um, ability to 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 identify disturbances in nature. So, for example, seeing a stone um, made, uh, which is out of place or mud scraped on a stone, or something which doesn't look quite right, or to see animal tracks. Uh, to help uh, identify a buried, ex which can help um, them work out if there are buried explosives in the area. Um, so we've been working with with, with the uh, with the army uh, to do this. Um, so for example, if if they see lots of animal tracks in an area, um, it's very very clear that there isn't an explosive there because otherwise the animals would have uh, either would probably have discovered it and uh, not be there. And um, so this really helps the army, and uh, I think uh, has this course has a ninety two percent satisfaction rating. Um, from what I saw, so um, this has been going on since the beginning of of since uh, in the last two months, uh, and and the last thing I want to talk about is the army. There's there's a few more I could talk about, but don't have time unfortunately. Um, is the issue of garbage. Um, so uh, garbage uh, you can imagine with uh, three hundred thousand soldiers uh, in the world uh, being sustained uh, by uh, by lovely people at home who are sending um, goods to the front. There's a lot of trash. Um, and trash attracts animals. Um, I was speaking to Guy, uh, who uh, who's who's the director of 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 our uh, project with the army, and he was telling me of of a soldier who'd actually been bitten by a fox while he was sleeping because the fox had come into the camp because the fox was attracted by food and um, and bit the soldier. Uh, he wasn't too badly damaged, but obviously it's not nice to be bitten by a fox. So damaged, hurt. Um, not nice to be bitten by a fox. Um, so we made sure to be working with the army. Um, with, the, with the army logistics corps to make sure there's uh, proper heavy uh, heavy duty bins um, around where the soldiers are congregating and patrolling, uh, like this bin here, um, which is a uh, hardcore. Um, this is it's made of a uh, really solid plastic, uh, uh, a, a very uh, heavy lid uh, to prevent animals coming in, and uh, and and um, and this and this uh, helps stop um, uh, the spread of trash, uh, garbage, which helps. Uh, which helps prevent animals being attracted. So you can see on the front, uh, the picture of the animals they're trying to avoid. Uh, the smallest being the cat, the little black cat, the orange fox. Uh, then we have a jackal and bigger than that is a, is a wild boar, which uh, with its uh, razor sharp tusks and being extremely heavy and powerful is not something you want to mess with or something you want to uh, attract because uh, it's going to cause uh, really a great deal of, 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 uh, of damage and, and havoc uh, within a base, uh, within a little camp of the soldiers. Um, and so the last thing, and Lawrence, uh, Lawrence, just to say that to translate, it said that when uh, when it's all over, there was a slogan there in Hebrew: "When it's all over, nature remains," which is a uh, which is an important reminder for the soldiers who are out there and for everybody. Yeah, thank you, Jay. Um, so, so the last oh. okay. So the last part of uh, of, of my presentation uh, we're talking about is the potential impact of the rebuilding of the Gaza envelope. Um, so in a second, I'm going to talk about the natural values of, of, of the area, of, of the Gaza envelope, um, which, which is like a lovely phrase, but that doesn't necessarily mean anything, especially if you don't live in Israel. Um, but this picture, I think, uh, says a, a thousand words. Um, this is, this is uh, a picture of the, of the Deromadon Red South Festival, uh, where, which, which occurs every, uh, every winter uh, in January and February. Uh, where where the red uh, crown and enemies, or in Hebrew kalaniot, um, blossom, creating these red carpets um, of uh, that, as you can see here in this picture, uh, which which attracts uh, tourists uh, from all over Israel uh, for hiking, uh, cycling, um, uh, festival. They're, they're in, in normal years, their festivals are are organised. Um, obviously, it brings a lot of money to the area. Um, and and when we talk about the natural area, when we talk about the Western Negev, we're not talking about a desert. We're talking about these grasslands, these flowering uh, grasslands, and this is th this is what we're fighting to protect uh, when we're talking about uh, trying to preserve the, the open spaces of of the Western Negev. Um, so here um, are some flowers. Uh, these are called uh, baby breast uh, flowers. Um, these these are wildflowers, and and this was taken a couple of weeks ago by Amir Balaban, uh, who is on reserve duty, um, 
and uh, you, you may think it's a secret, but when you see the next picture, you'll realize it's not. Um, but uh, uh, Amir took this beautiful photo, um, and, and you can see that after the rains, the grass comes back. The, the, the Western Negev is grassland. Um, grass is is very resilient. It, it comes back every year. It goes in the annual cycle, and, and the annual cycle starts again this year. So the grass is coming up. The early flowers are coming up, and uh, and, and we expect that nature will, will will recover very very quickly, or at least the vegetation anyway. Um, so here's Amir in his uh, army uniform. Uh, he's uh and and uh, he's talking uh, with SPNI's uh, planning team, who uh who went on a field trip a couple of weeks ago, uh to discuss um to, to discuss the possibilities for for rebuilding um the the, the envelope the Gaza envelope, and what what work we need to be doing to 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 protect the the natural values to protect the grasslands the forests um the uh, the things which, which which improve the quality of life for, for all residents um so our priorities um so priority number one is to preserve the natural values uh of of the western negev um and the northern negev why either, either both why either and both uh, we want to pr uh, promote a holistic uh, plan, so we don't want any, we want to promote a systemic uh, plan uh, for the entire region, not just looking at rebuilding uh, each individual individual kibbutz by itself. Um, we, uh, you know, um, I, I want to say this in a tactful way, um, which won't get me into tr any trouble. Um, but one of the Zionism's worst instincts is is to show mastery of the land by uh, conquering it. Um, or oh, sorry, sorry, to show our ownership of the land by mastering it, for example, with the draining of the swamps. Um, and we don't want to see that now. Like already the government's put forward a plan to build a new settlement. And I just to clarify, um, by settlement, I mean a new human settlement, whether that's a city, a town, a hamlet, a village, um, or whatnot, not, uh, not a settlement as with turning the West Bank, I'm not talking about building a new settlement in Gaza. Um, we're just talking about building uh, an, an extra town or something uh, in the in uh, uh, in in the area to add to the existing uh, existing uh, settlements there, the existing towns, uh, human habitations there, uh, and that's not something that we want. We want uh, we want to see the uh, we 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 want to we want to see, and we're going to fight to promote a plan uh, which sees um, the cities the the area rebuilt from from the current uh, footprints outwards, rather than creating another footprint. Um, just plonk it down somewhere else. Um, and the last part is 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 creating is is to is is to um integrate you know renewable energy um not solar panels on the ground and taking out fields which is not good for nature but to put rooftop uh to you know to make sure uh all the all the buildings are built with rooftop rooftop solar panels and um, and storage and uh storage to the the area gets something like 300 days of excuse me 300 days of, of sunlight every year there's no reason why this area why this region should not get should not be should, should not be uh totally, should not be carbon neutral uh in the rebuilding and as part of that is also rebuilt reimagining public transport to you know we don't want to see um a plan uh the area rebuilt just relying on private cars um so so um we uh SP and I last week uh we we completed our position paper and this is uh, just a slide uh some summarizing it uh so there's two phases of 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 our work at this moment of of what we see um happening what we want to see happening uh one is uh so we start with the restoration phase um so talking um you know wanting to uh, carry out surveys uh to understand the damage uh to start restoring those areas obviously waste management so um there's there's a lot of rubble there's there's a lot of uh damaged buildings and there's and the question is how how are we going to uh how's the government going to dispose of this uh, we don't like we want it we, like, you know as, as a environmental organization as a you know as, as as an organization which promotes sustainable living uh this these materials need to be recycled and need to be reused uh, as much as possible because otherwise it will just go to landfill um obviously working with the IDF um when they demobilize um as, as I said before we have a great relationship with the IDF so we you know have uh, connections with the logistics uh and engineering cores making sure there are protocols uh for for properly cleaning up after them um may and uh, reducing the impact on nature making sure that every you know hazardous and toxic materials are, are taken away properly um that temporary roads uh where, where possible are removed 
and um, especially in the north, making sure that that any continued operations uh, tries to protect nature as much as possible, and uh, and create and uh, implementing the protocols uh, to do that. Because with all this stuff, um, with, with 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 both phases, the restoration and reconstruction phase, there's going to be no uh, appetite, national appetite, for stopping for uh, impact surveys and planning permits and lawsuits in the Supreme Court. The, the government, the, the country is going to want to let these people come back home. So any, so so once it once uh, the the area is is secure, people are going to come back quickly, and no one's going to stop it. So that's why it's really really important that that all this work happens now, uh, so that we're proactive in uh, in promoting in, in in promoting a sustainable uh, rebuilding of, of the Gaza envelope. Uh, and as I just touched on uh, just before, um, temporary housing solutions. So people are going to come back. Not all the houses are going to be fit for settlements. Um, and we're going to, um, you know, we don't want these temporary housing set, uh, solutions, you know, camps of, you know, of water cabins or temporary structures to be built in the middle of, these, of the grasslands of the Dharamadom. Ideally, there are, there are, you know, building plans for the area uh, already existing. And we're, we're going to want to make sure that, you know, the temporary housing with all the sanitation and electricity and roads and, and everything um, are built within either within existing um, existing neighborhoods, existing uh, towns, uh, areas, or within areas which are already planned for construction. Um, as and as in the reconstruction phase, as I said before, at SBNI, we want to make sure that um, that we're, we're building out from existing settlements, not building new uh, settlements. Uh, renewing urban spaces efficiently, which includes integrating urban nature. We have a great uh, urban nature um, program um, to promote sustainable construction, which may uh, include, you know, promoting um, newer technologies, if not newer, if not uh, new approaches to, to you know, to um, uh, to to create better houses for for the residents. Um, to uh, you know, you know. Uh, sustain, sustainable construction also inclu includes making sure that things are better insulated to reduce electricity bills. Um, so all that, so we, we want to see all that happen. Uh, sustainable energy, as I said before, solar panels and where on, on roofs and not on in fields or, or creating large uh, solar panel, um, uh, I guess, solar, panel, solar infra energy infrastructure. Um, Israel is a tiny country, as I'm sure you all know. And we don't, as a biodiversity hotspot, we don't have the luxury of, of dedicating uh, open spaces um, to to uh, energy uh, for 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 solar energy and clean energy. And this is always a tension in our work. Uh, but certainly, this area is not an area which should be um, sacrificed for for sustainable energy. We can do it. We can we can meet the the region's energy needs just by building on roofs. And to do that, we'll have to uh, promote. Uh, new uh, regulations, but that's also very much within our goals, and we can do that. Um, you know, preserving open spaces, including for tourism. You know, the picture before the, the Ramadan festival uh, says it all. And uh, finally, promoting sustainable agriculture. Uh, Israeli agriculture is uh, not especially sustainable, and um, we we want to make sure that that you know, that we, where possible, to we can try and promote uh, approaches where where farms are using less pesticides. Where they're using the, uh, where their um, where their fields are, are less uh, monocultures, where they have uh, species uh, of like plant species which which uh, which, which can uh, help sustain uh, pollinating insects uh, like honeybees and other Israeli bees. It's like I think we have like thirty something species of bees in Israel, and um, you know thinking about uh, we want to promote a different way of of, of sustainable agriculture. Um, so I come sort of now to the end of of of, of my uh, lecture of of the webinar. And I just want to say, like, I throughout this uh, throughout this webinar, I talked about different organisations, the Park and Nature Authority, um, whose whose responsibility is is to care for the animals, um, the the IDF, whose job it is obviously is to is to protect our borders and 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 fight this war and, and bring our hostages home. But SBNI, our job here is is to protect nature, is is to make sure that it, it's make sure that the natural infrastructure that that we rely on, that we rely on. Um, is there for, for us? Like at the moment, um, as Jay said in his um, in his letter in, in his e newsletter on Thursday, um, espionage is in our seventieth year, and the, the work we're doing using nature, using nature's power to help heal um, a traumatized nation, uh, to help uh, reduce people's anxiety, 
is probably the most important work we do, we've ever done in our 70 year history. And this is a quote um, from that that we received from from a month from one of our from our newest program using nature um, to help um, Israelis, which we just started doing overnight camps for teenagers who've been stuck in hotels. And, and this mum, and the, you know, the, the parents are reticent to to let their kids go out, um, you know, to, away from them for for a few nights. Um, and she said to us, you know, SBNI might not be the most obvious organisation to turn to at this moment. But you gave us exactly what we needed, and we're hearing this again and again. And we're only able to do this because of you. So I want to take this opportunity really to thank you all for your support from our emergency campaign. Um, and I hope as we come to the end of year um, and as you're considering your end of year gifts, um, that I hope you uh, consider continuing to support us um, because we really need your help because we're doing amazing work as um, as you're going to continue to hear about in the next few months. And I'm telling you, if you if you support us, you're going to be proud of, of the work that you support. Um, and so with that, I'm going to answer some questions. Thank you very much. Wow, awesome. Lawrence, thank you so much. Chapeau. Thank really you. I'm going to leave this up here. I'm going to leave this up here so you can scan the code. And tour see. de force. Thank you. Thank pinch you. out for a view, bigger view. When I pinch out, do you see it bigger now on your screen? Uh, no? I don't know. I see that I'm looking at the questions. So that's all right. There you go. I'm just trying to. Okay. See. Well, you have some questions. Um, I'll just take one or two, Lawrence. You can scan them. Maggie asked about defining the Gaza envelope. Um, um, the Gaza envelope. Yeah, go on, Jay. You, would you like? Would you like no, to go, go on it? it? Go for it. Yeah, go for it. Go. No, go, Jay. No, I was just going to say there's um there's official there's official um people that are being that were evacuated by the army like on day two of the war and those are the settlements that were, were are within seven kilometers of the Gaza border. That's four miles. I think there's seventeen or eighteen of those settlements. There's another several settlements, I think a total of 27 that have been evacuated up to about six miles from the Gaza border, eight miles. But that that's the term when we say Gaza environs. We're talking about that sort of immediate area, but also a greater area around that is affected. Um, yeah, OK, so I got the questions up. So Blanche, unfortunately, I can't speak slower, though I think for me this is actually quite good. Um, but the beautiful <laughs> bird was Jay, Jay told me beforehand, so I, I did my best. Um, uh, you, and these subtitles and AI subtitles. Um, the beautiful bird is a uh, hubara busted. Um, it's a uh, uh, hubara busted. H uh, o u b a r a, um, and it, it's uh, quite. It's a very rare bird now, unfortunately. Um, so someone asked about: Do we anticipate pollution for the destruction of infrastructure in Gaza? Sorry, I'll say it much slower. How do you anticipate pollution following the destruction of infra the destruction of infrastructure in Gaza? Uh, will affect the water quality and wildlife. Um, I, 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 I haven't, I didn't get any answers on that. I didn't ask that specifically, but, but it's, we're, we're a tiny land. We already saw beforehand that, that the breakdown of the sewage, even before this war, that the breakdown of the sewage works was uh, actually led to a closure of, of, I think it's the Kim beach, um, by Ashkelon, but like the nearest Israeli beach uh, to Gaza was closed, um, over Sukkot because of sewage, um, so it's definitely going to affect us. Like nature knows no borders, pollution knows no borders. It, it, we're very interconnected with them, and um, and so and and really, um, it's, it's something you know, helping Gaza deal, helping the Gaza deal with, with the sewage and the pollution is 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 gonna is only going to help us. It's not going to stay across the border. Um, Jay, do you want to add anything to that? Uh, no. Good job. Um, Okay, if the feral dogs pose a danger to us, why not call them or send them back to Gaza? Um, I doubt we're going to send them back to Gaza. I don't necessarily uh, think that's possible. Um, yeah, I'm sure that, like again, I, I don't think anyone's really um, got that far, got got that far um, with like actually what to do about the feral dogs. Other than so many people are, are important, people are acknowledging it's an issue. Most likely, it will either be a call. I'm not sure how popular that will be. Um, or as, as someone said before, they'll they'll give them uh, birth control and try and control the population that way. But it will definitely be something that will be dealt with. And um, we'll, if, once uh, we find out, we'll we'll put it in a newsletter so to to let you know as a follow up. Um, so David wrote, "Is there concern about toxic substances from ordnance destroyed vehicles impacting the environment?" Um, definitely yes. That is something, but but again, it's something that we can work with the engineering and logistics units. Uh, to create the protocols uh, to make sure there's proper cleanup, uh, and and also like it's Israel, like it's the home front. We're not fighting like in in, in the Americas in Afghanistan, where it was like where it's like okay, all this toxic 
all, all you know all, the, all these toxins are are far far away from 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 the motherland um this is israel like israel's a small country like we can't there's no there's not really an option to leave toxic substances out for in in in, in open spaces for you know for, for hikers to, to come across and you know and and, and get hurt um okay uh gabriel said oh, oh you, gabriel i think is asking about volunteering um i don't necessarily there's lots of we're, sbi is not really doing volunteering in 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 the gaza community but there, there are lots of organizations uh who do and if you email me afterwards um you or you can just email whoever sent you the email for this for this webinar we'll get back to you to let you know uh what's our plan for the feral dogs um, Wait one second, Lawrence. I just I just add to that. Yeah, I mean we have I've seen collated lists of organizations um, that are taking volunteering, not just in the Gaza envelope. I mean, but you can, you know, if you want to volunteer, there's or regular organizations that are taking busloads of people to, you know, pick agricultural produce, to package uh, things, uh, toiletries and stuff for the soldiers, to cook and package food. Restaurants are doing it. Catering services private homes, all kinds of logistics centers to work in. There's driving. Uh, our colleague Barry Sheridan uh, delivers food in uh, Ashkelon to uh, people that haven't been evacuated, but a lot of services, city services are not functioning yet. All kinds of things to do. Uh, we, we, again, SPNI per se doesn't really run a lot of these things. We might have some ad hoc volunteering if you're settled in Israel, uh, have a place to live, etc. But we don't you know, we don't we don't bring volunteers or, uh, you know, use them in an organized way at this point. Um, yeah. So just go. So the next question, I think, probably adds to this. Uh, what's our plan for feral dogs? Um, SP, um, unfortunately, SBI is not. Uh, it may seem it, but SBI is not an all powerful that organization which does everything. And um, so that actually the, the people dealing with the feral dogs will be the Park and Nature Authority. Um, and I, I imagine they'll have they'll have vets uh, either tranquilizing or, or shooting them uh, and bringing the population under control once uh, people start to come back and and, and once the security. Yeah, uh, once, I'm once actually sure the health. The, I think I think the health ministry and the veterinary service of Israel will also be involved in that. That seems like a pretty prominent health hazard if they start. Yeah, yeah, army people move back. Yeah, the army also have vets. The municipalities that there are like the government in its various forms we'll, we'll be doing dealing with the, with the feral dogs um not us as an ngo although as much as although it would i think israel's nature would be better if we actually were the government too but so they'd be and um susan asked about a mine clearing um and um i don't think they've been i i haven't had any reports of mines um so i don't think that's going to really an issue um there are minefields like in the golan heights uh and along and um they're they're very very clearly marked um, and uh, and on the Jordan Valley, um, there were mines, and they they've been cleared out. And um, the bunkers along there, through a different project with the Army for the Protection, through the Army for the Protection of Nature, uh, we turned some of the older uh, bunkers into uh, bat uh, roosts, um, which is a really fun, uh, really one of my favorite projects, uh, especially to visit, um, which I visited once, in fact. So no, probably not favorite to visit, um, but they, they we turned the, um, the 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 bunkers. By adding um, resin and and, uh, and other materials to turn them to, to create artificial stalactites uh, for the bats to latch onto and uh, and roost in when when they come down to the Jordan Valley um, uh, when on them on their sort of annual migrations. Um, I think that's all the questions in the Q and A. So right any... in the chat, yeah. Lawrence, uh, you can take a look. I'm going to answer Tim's question. Um, I just okay. talked to Dan about this. Uh, Dan Alon, our CEO, about uh, government plans to uh, really increase development on the Golan Heights. No, nothing has been officially shelved. Uh, nothing's been really advanced because everybody's so distracted. But the planning committees are moving ahead. The government is sort of been signaling its intentions not to change any of the worst environmental policies that any government in this history of the country has probably proposed in terms of uh, bypassing environmental regulations and, uh, you know, fast tracking all kinds of development, including, as you point out, they want to triple the population of humans on the Golan Heights, uh, really one of the last natural large kind of wild areas of Israel. They want to build a new city, uh, double Katsurin's population, a couple more uh, human settlements, as Lawrence calls them, of various types. Uh, crisscross it with infrastructure, terrible, terrible plans. Uh, nothing's been shelved. I mean, the good news is nothing's gone really forward much in the last couple of months, but um, 
the government's bad policies remain in place. Also in the Gulf of Eilat, et cetera. I just want to also actually add, add to that from a different perspective. Uh, first of all, Elena's corrected me that apparently it's not Hubara busted, but McQueen's busted. So that's why I guess. Hubara is the Hebrew word, is it not? Isn't Hubara Hebrew? No, no. Well, no. anyway, it's, it's, it's a busted and not spelled with an A. That's all I'll say. Um, so just, just in the issue of the government putting forward uh, environmental, uh, environmentally uh, dangerous uh, or environmentally harmful plans um, for SPNI, is that is is actually the war? I'll, I'll say it differently. Um, people who are going to benefit um, the 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 business, the corporations which are going to benefit uh, from from this, are seeing this as an opportunity because they can go forward uh, because um, they can. And it's that you know they have the opportunity to make money. And while SPNI is uh, a little bit hum hamstrung at the moment uh, for two reasons, one is uh, we have lots of our of, of our staff um, in the reserve duty, so so that we, they can't do their job, and we don't necessarily have the opportunity to bring in our own reserves uh, to to fill in any gaps. And also the media, which is one of our one of our tools to uh, to put pressure on to put pressure to to alter plans or to stop plans. The media obviously uh, is busy talking about um, the war and other related topics, and there isn't really any uh, oxygen for for the environment for environmental issues at the moment, and that's causing us problems. And and thirdly, SP9 is an organisation um, where you know the the war has a has a financial impact on, on our work, and and therefore that that means that we have less resources uh, to uh, to to uh, to do this. Um, uh, so that's one. Uh, Dan said, "Yes, this definitely um, this is an opportunity for us. Um, definitely an opportunity for SB and I uh, to help uh, bring um, a whole new generation of Israelis into nature and to show how important nature is uh, for 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 Israel and society, um, our culture, our people, and, and its healing value. And, and we're doing that. And um, and hopefully in our seventies year, we're we're going to see a, a, a paradigm shift in." in uh, Israeli's relationship to nature. Uh, my pleasure, Elizabeth. Uh, Martin talked about, yeah, yeah, so Martin, we also cut ears of, off of dogs here to show, um, the corners of dogs ears here to show they've been um, they've been vaccinated. And I'm sure they're gonna do that as well. Um, um, okay, I don't know about that. Okay, fine. Um, and that's it, I think I've answered All everything. Right. So thank you very much, everyone, for joining us. I hope the presentation was good. I hope you uh, you understood what I was saying, which is definitely, uh, for me, is definitely a, a worry. I'm sorry, Blanche. Um, and uh, thank you, everyone, for your support. Like, I, I'm really privileged to, uh, as I said at the beginning, to work for this amazing organization doing really, really amazing work. And um, I think you should uh, share in some of the nachas um, for sharing such a, you know, for supporting such a wonderful organization with, with doing unbelievably inspiring and heartwarming work at the moment and in so many ways and you know when i came back two months ago three, yeah three, i guess nearly three months ago now i couldn't have imagined uh the work we're doing now and it's uh it, it's really something to be part of really 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 makes me feel good and really helps me uh you know help helps me helps me feel good at this really really challenging time uh so thank you to all of you uh who, who have donated to, to make that happen Thanks to everybody who participated, engaged, really, uh, really is heartwarming. All the support we've been receiving all year, all the time, but but especially now. By the way, Lawrence, it's a new tagline Dan invented today for us. Uh, um, nature always, especially now. Oh, good. Um, yeah. Um, really, thank you, Lawrence. It's a great, great presentation. Good questions, everybody. Yeah. Uh, we're back in two weeks. Uh, yeah, Jay Sunday, will be... same time. Yeah, Jay will be talking about the about all espionage work. So I'm, I'm sure you, you a lot of, you know beyond the emergency campaign, we'll be talking about all the other things we've been doing, and it it really is amazing. So please uh, come back in uh, two weeks' time. We're at the beginning of a new phase of our uh, of our work in terms of uh, a big Nature Heals program and getting Israelis out to nature in many many ways. I've written about it. Uh, if you're not on our mailing list, let us know and uh, we will get you on it. Sign up. Uh, we sign, can't sign up. Sign up, please, uh, on our site. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for supporting. Thank you for engaging. Thank you very much, Lawrence. Thank you, Alain, for uh, 
helping us in the back office there with uh, some of the yes. biological questions. Finis, and, Finis uh, asked, by the way, is this available recorded? Yeah, it's recorded. Um, it's all on our website. It'll be up on our website probably tomorrow at some point. Yes, uh, we will so send a link in the next time we communicate with you. Cool. So thank Thanks you very much, much, everybody. I have a Let us hear from stay you. safe. And stay in touch. Let us hear from you. Stay safe wherever you are. Feedback is always appreciated. All right, bye, everyone. Yes. And happy <laughs> Hanukkah. Bye. Bye-bye.